Hopefully I spelled it right. Excellent. Okay, thanks. <laughs> good to have everyone here. Good to see some familiar faces again. So thank you for coming back. Um, I don't think I've got a list of who is coming for this one, so we might just make a start. I'm just going to quickly double check my diary here. Um, yeah, so let's just make a start. Um, so uh, as you'll have seen from the blurb that um, Claire sent around, I think last week, hopefully, which you received, um, we are diving in further to this uh, idea of a natural capital approach, thinking in particular about natural capital uh, mapping and modelling tools, and we are very fortunate to have Dr Leo Paskett from the University of Edinburgh, who was one of the original team on our CXC project and has particular expertise in these areas, so he's going to be leading today. Uh, I'll be chipping in, uh, but particularly uh, facilitating discussion and uh, leading a concluding segment uh, to have a think about how this then feeds into uh, our thinking around um, uh, potentially using ecosystem markets. Um, so we'll make that link back to some of the stuff we were doing in the um, uh, last two sessions, I guess, um, if I remember rightly. Uh, so the, the format is going to be a, a series of, uh, of mini presentations followed by discussions. Um, I'm going to ask Leo to kind of just vaguely keep an eye on time, just in terms of you knowing how long you need for each of the, of the segments to get through in the two hours. I'm going to suggest we have a break around about halfway as well, because the two hour session is quite long. Um, and um, as with the previous sessions, uh, have your questions coming in the chat um, while Leo is talking. Don't forget your questions, just stick them there and uh, we'll come to them. Uh, but of course, uh, on mic as well. So uh, for Leo's benefit, if we could do a quick round of introductions, just who you are, um, yeah, your job role, um, and then I'll hand over to Leo to fully introduce himself. So I've got Andy, then Lizzie, Sorry, Andrew, then Karen, and then Lizzie, and then Pip, Keith, Raffaella, and Claire. So, Andy. Hi, uh, afternoon, Mark. Hi, folks. Yeah, yeah. Andy Tharm. I'm the um, well, natural resources strategy manager at SOCI, South of Scotland Enterprise, and part of my duties are to coordinate the South of Scotland all up. Wonderful. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Mark. Sorry. Cameron Morley, Dumfries and Galloway Council, uh, Countryside Development Manager. Uh, basically, I'm working on, with Andy and uh, Scottish Borders on the South of Scotland Regional uh, Land Use Pilot. Fantastic. Amongst other things. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> uh, Lizzie. Hello, I'm Lizzie, based up in the Northwest Highlands um, in Ackledebury. I work with uh, Rachel Skeen, who is the project manager for our ARLUP, which is a very com uh, community-based ARLUP. Um, Rachel isn't here today because I think she's out in the field with the communities uh, consulting, find it having interesting conversations, I hope. Um, we have commissioned a natural capital assessment, baseline assessment for the area, so it'd be really interesting to hear how our experience uh, yeah, in the in the greater uh, context, how we fit in. Um, so that, thanks very much for being here. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Raffaella, over to you. Uh, I'm Raffaella Diesel. I'm the Ecology Officer at the Scottish Borders Council. And I'm going to be involved more on the sidelines with the ARLOP, with the, the, the pilot projects we're going to have going. Um, yeah, I'm just more interested in the mapping side of things, so I thought just what's going on. Great, fantastic. Thank you, Pip. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Pip Tabor, project manager with the Southern Uplands Partnership, currently working with Andy and Karen on the um, South of Scotland Rural Regional Land Use Partnership pilot project. Good yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Pip. Great. And Keith? Hi there, folks. Um, I don't know if, if you can hear me. I'm trying to bring my camera up. Apologies. Give me one sec. There we go. Hi. Um, I, yeah, my name's Keith McConey. I work for the Scottish Government. Um, um, my official job title, I guess, is helping out with the Arlops. 
Um, Claire Guy uh, unfortunately couldn't make it today, um, so uh, I'm coming along to make sure that we're represented and, and um, hopefully answer any questions and like that, um, that that might come up. Um, Mark, I don't know if Claire let you know, um, with, a, with a couple of the ARLUPs, we're, we're going through a bit of a turnover in terms of, of uh, people that are involved, so um, we might not have anybody from the northeast, um, uh, Karen Gorms or Loch Lomond, because there's a bit of a, a crossover in terms of, of people coming in. Brilliant. No worries. Um, and a question to you, Keith, from Andy on the chat. So, is that no. Claire, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm actually on my phone at the moment because our systems don't allow um, a Zoom, which is a bit unfortunate. Oh, so if I cut off at any point, just let me know. But I am Claire MacArthur. I am a Policy and Strategy Manager within Aberdeen City Council. Um, fairly new into post, but a few years ago I was team leader for our Strategic Development Plan Authority. So I have a bit of background in terms of the regional situation, just no recent to background to, to draw on, I'm afraid. Um, so today for me, um, this is more of a listening exercise. Um, as I say, I am on my phone, so the Wi-Fi may cut out at any point. And I'm afraid to say I can only stay until three o'clock this afternoon, but looking forward to um, hearing the discussion and being back into the, the regional fold, as it were. Thanks. Right. Excellent. So hopefully it's something useful for you before then. Um, I'm just up the road from you. I live in, uh, in Huntley. So uh, is it, if I remember rightly, Doug, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Hi. Brilliant. Hi, Mark. Uh, long time no see. Hope you're well. Um, <laughs> yes, very well. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah. My name's Doug McNabb. I'm a, a land use consultant. Um, I'm working with Andy and Pip and colleagues on the regional land use partnership pilot for South of Scotland. So, um, yeah, really looking forward to hearing the session today. Fantastic. So we want to keep things as practical as possible. So if this is getting a bit esoteric or anything, uh, please give us that feedback, uh, get the practical questions in, redirect us as relevant. I am aware that you are preparing your rural land use frameworks. Um, I've been talking to Claire Gee about this. Um, and uh, and so Hannah and I are putting in uh, an application for some funding to uh, to help support that process and to give feedback on those uh, on those frameworks uh, and just kind of hopefully be a, a helpful, useful resource for you to call on. Uh, if we don't get that funding, we will still provide support. Um, it'll be on a just on a, on a kind of a, a more limited basis, but uh, but we want to be with you for for the long haul on this um, and do whatever we can to help. Although today is officially our last uh, training session, so. Uh, yep, no worries. Uh, others need to leave at three as well. Um, so uh, let's make sure we uh, do have our break around then to make that nice and comfortable. So Leo, over to you if you want to further introduce yourself and kick us off. Hi everyone, I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, I'm using a new headset, so which crashed in the last meeting, so hopefully it'll go oh. okay. Uh, oh, I'm Leo, um, I know a number of you, um, and yeah, I'm a, I've am actually just moved, I'm now an assistant professor at um, Harriet Watt um, in physical geography, um, that. and that's okay, it's very recent. Um, and yeah, as Mark said, well, obviously I've been involved in aspects related to the ARLUPS for a while, um, and I'm more a hydrologist by background, so the kind of modelling aspects on the water side and the land use change side are sort of my area, and then have been involved in natural capital frameworks as well in various ways. So hopefully this will be useful to you. I'm very aware that some of you have a huge amount of experience in this area, um, some possibly less so. Um, so this is a overview at a number of different levels, and hopefully it's a good start of discussion as well. Um, Great. Mark, do you want me to just kick off with? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll mute myself. So yeah, please just go for it. I think you should have uh, okay. the ability to share a screen. Great. Um, just try to. Now are you seeing, is everyone seeing that okay? Perfect. Yeah, oh, good. You have suddenly moved to a different mode somehow, and I can now see your next slide. I'm not sure if did you just do something. Ah, I've swapped screens. Can you see see the presenter view? Yes, I can. Can you see that? 
That's better. Wonderful. Is that better? Okay. Nope. Hello. Yeah. So I've lost you all now. Can you? Uh, we can still hear and see you. Can Although you see the here. show? It's gone black on my screen. Yeah, same here. <laughs> Weirdly. Do you want to? Sorry about this. Next again and see what happens. I'm not pressing anything. Give me oh. one sec. Oh, <laughs> that's a bit worrying. Mm. <laughs> How strange. Why don't you go back to the uh, presenter view? At least it's not um, not going black in that view. Maybe that will just. Let's get back. Sorry, I've lost all functionality. <laughs> oh, that nightmare. Okay, uh, I have your slides. So how about um, uh, I? I can't actually do anything on my screen. I'm very sorry about this. Okay, no worries. Crashed. Uh, um, I might have to try a different computer. If, ah, you've come back. You've yeah. Come back. So here I am, and uh, I will share slides. If, sorry about this. Um, if you can just tell me next when you want the next slide, then. Um, all good. So just hold on a sec while I load the latest version. Okay. Take two. Over to you. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so today, um, yeah, we're going to talk quickly about the natural capital approach um, that we covered in the climate exchange report from earlier this year, which I hope some of you have seen, um, and particularly focusing a bit on the kind of natural capital mapping and modelling tools um, aspects of the natural capital approach. So if you could switch to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of the policy context, which I'm sure you'll be aware of, um, the, an outline of the approach itself, um, which is on the right here. We'll go into this in a bit more detail, so you don't need to worry about that for now. Um, and then the natural capital assessment step is one part of this process. And then I think particularly useful, so I'd like to get onto this as soon as possible, is probably the case studies aspects um, and learning from existing case studies, because I think that's the way to keep this practical. Um, and we could maybe talk briefly about valuation methods and markets. Um, and Mark will talk more about the market and finance side. And then I just listed some further resources as well that might be useful as you go about this process. So if you could switch to the next slide. Great. Um, so starting with the obvious, what is a natural, what is natural capital and uh, the natural capital approach? Um, you'll see lots and lots of different figures and diagrams out there. Um, some I find useful, some I find not very useful. Um, and I found this one, I mean, this is quite a useful figure because it breaks things up in a way that a lot of the tools and methods break things up. Um, and that's particularly, I wanted to emphasize here um, that we're talking about uh, from in terms of natural capital uh, stocks of natural assets which we can often map um, and look at spatial sort of quality indicators as well um, and then this kind of very key step which is where I think a lot of the confusion in this area comes in is is how these are then translated into ecosystem services of various kinds and that's what a lot of the tools that are available now do in very different ways um, and that's why it's quite hard to get one's head around quite often. Um, so converted into these services, and then normally there's a sort of list of final goods and services, and then the final benefits, which may be um, quantified in market or non-market value terms. So if you could switch to the next slide, thanks. So in terms of natural uh, capital policy evolution in the UK, um, we've got really things that have happened i suppose over the last 20 years um particularly guided initially by the millennium ecosystem assessment and then various uh, national ecosystem assessments and the the, the formation of the natural capital committee um and at the same time a lot of changes internationally happening in terms of at the un level in terms of how to develop environmental accounts at an international level uh, that can be linked into national accounting systems for the economy as well um so into it 
as we've moved through the last decade, um, there have been various uh, sort of key processes at a UK government level. Um, for example, um, revisions to the Green Book guidance, um, DEFRA's 25 year environment plan, and then most recently, lots of work on various tools and approaches through um, DEFRA's work, the ENCA project, the Dasgupta review. And then we're beginning to see the emergence of much more standardized approaches to accounting in this area, which are good to be aware of. Um, just to underline that not many of these approaches currently account for biodiversity, but they biodiversity is factored in in various ways, which we can come to. If you can move on, great. Just briefly on the Scotland context and those Scottish policymakers on the call, correct me here if I'm wrong. Um, but um, I suppose it's good to think, to break things down between the kind of national cap natural capital accounts um, in Scotland and the natural capital asset index in Scotland, the accounts being part of the UK, wider UK accounting framework, uh, trying to put um, natural capital into a national accounting framework and covering lots of different um, natural assets, um, compiled by the Office of National Statistics. Um, using a range of approaches for evaluation for valuation and based on net present values throughout. Um, so that's the national accounts in Scotland has a subset of accounts, I suppose. Um, but there's also the compilation of the natural capital asset index um, in Scotland, which doesn't include uh, monetary values, um, but it looks at much more in detail, at, I suppose, habitat quantity through land cover change data and habitat quality indicators from various data sets. And we can talk through, if you want to come back to it on the right, is the kind of process for the Natural Capital Asset Index compilation in Scotland. And you can see that there are four main sets of data inputs, um, some of them standardized data sets. Um, and then there's a waiting process between those to then calculate a final um, Natural Capital Asset score. And that's very much a national level process. Um, good to be aware of in the context of ILOPS. Um, and we might dis discuss a bit more about how the two things integrate. If you could move on. And then finally, and I think this is particularly relevant for, um, for ILOPS and for ILOPS is the um, corporate natural capital assessment and accounting and here lots of different initiatives have emerged over the years um, and this has become really quite a complex landscape with different private sector organizations uh, partnerships etc developing all sorts of different things um, this figure on the right I find quite useful because it starts to group um, some of these and we can sort of get a sense of what different things are trying to do um, so we've got initiatives like the Capitals Coalition, which are trying to outline a process. Um, we've got research providers um, doing detailed research on, say, aspects of quantification of natural capital assets. And then this box um, in the middle, the frameworks, methods and valuation factors. Um, as I said, there are various standardized processes which are being developed um, under the frameworks and then methods within those um, to do aspects of the process and then there's various valuation factors now there are for example the every event environmental valuation reference inventory which are used to um count to put values on natural capital assets which um and ecosystem services which um could be quite relevant within the context of ILOFs. um if you could move on that would be great so um, moving on then, in terms of the natural capital approach, um, this is the figure from the report that we wrote back in, I think it was April now. Um, so how does all of this come together? Um, and this was the kind of summary figure from that. And I'll use this to structure, um, yeah, structure parts of the presentation. So if you could just bring up the first pop-up window. <laughs> um, so we outlined six main steps. Um, these are quite close to other natural capital approaches, for example, that produced by the Natural Capital Coalition as well. Um, so you can, and there's some quite useful guidance within and very detailed guidance within certain documents on these steps. But I just wanted to quickly 
summarize these. Um, so starting with context and framing, um, this is questions around why, why are we doing a natural capital assessment? What decisions is it like to influence and where does it fit with wider policy? You could go to the next. Uh, what assets and why and whose values and key technical issues in the scope and aims that needs to be um, considered and what's driving these changes. Um, if you could, next one. Um, and then a, a, an aspect that differs slightly from the framework we outlined is the importance of stakeholder engagement, which is included within these other approaches, but is included here with, as a particular step. Um, so looking at particularly what kinds of approaches should be used and, and why to work with stakeholders. Next. And then the focus of this um, linking assets with ecosystem services um, and what effect uh, uh, different drivers have on those services. And next one, please. Sorry, that's the last one on the screen. And then obviously how, how will it is, and then the final feed. So that's the, if you could move on, that'd be great. So that was the, that's the overview, the kind of context I wanted to give. Um, I thought it might be appropriate to pause briefly here if anyone's got any questions on that. I think this, the next section is particularly about tools and case studies, which I think is where it would be good to focus our conversation. But if you've got any questions about the context, that would be great. Is it worth just talking through what we've got on the slide here? Is it, is it self-evident, I wonder? Um, um, I mean, certainly the, the, the valuation step at the end will, I'll, I'll talk about briefly. Um, uh, and uh, and you, it is optional. Um, uh, you don't have to do this. I think it's, th that is quite off-putting for a lot of people. Um, uh, you can do it for certain purposes, um, but you can still access uh, ecosystem markets if you want to without having to do that formal valuation step. Yeah. Um, equally, the forecasting kind of thing um, makes a lot of people think of kind of scary process-based models. Yeah. Uh, it could be just uh, qualitative scenarios, potentially. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, so that, and I yeah, think what the, the slide hopefully communicates is there's a whole load of different methods out there, including qualitative and quantitative, uh, scary and less scary, expensive <laughs> and uh, and cheap, uh, time consuming and uh, and quick. Yeah, I think what I wanted to highlight here was that within this kind of assessment box, there's generally these three steps which are, are referred to in quite different ways um, and in different sequences um, in in different tools and approaches. Um, and it's quite hard when you start reading about this um, to sort of, to summarize those, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And then within each of those steps, there are different tools, which could be quantitative or qualitative um, in those steps. So. Right, so I'm gonna stop sharing, but I'm gonna put yeah. um, those slides into the chat if you want to um, continue looking at them. Um, we are also uh, recording today, so for those of you who can't make the second half, um, you'll get a recording as well as these slides afterwards. <clears throat> so thoughts, reflections, questions on our introductory framing. Um, perhaps just all fairly obvious. Let's move on, get stuck into the tools and uh, what they look like in practice through the case studies. Can't see any questions in the chat, but does anyone want to raise a hand? If so, it's uh, under the reactions tab. And if not, let's dive into the uh, the main segment. Um, now this is this is the main uh, the main element today. So um, uh, let's just keep an eye on the time and make sure that we're finishing before three for a break. So if you can kind of manage to that, um, I think you may be looking for some uh, some discussion before then anyway. But um, back to you, Leo. Great. Could you put the presentation back up? Yep. Great. Um, 
so we've talked through yeah the typical the workflow and then yeah i wanted to talk a little bit more about the different tools that are emerging um and as i said there are many <laughs> um this is an estimate of over 50 i mean there are various reports which have reviewed many different um quantitative and qualitative tools um and yeah i've put links in on this presentation so you can explore those in your own time if you want to um I suppose the key here is to think about what they're trying to do. Um, and I suppose this comes into three main sets of tools. Um, those trying to map natural capital stocks. Um, so people using habitat and land use survey data, either locally sourced or national sources are obviously available in, in many areas. Um, there are natural capital accounting systems which can be used in conjunction with those and then various forms of condition assessment um, and stress indicators which are used either nationally or or with local data sets as well um, second set of tools is around quantifying ecosystem service flows um, so some of these might be more qualitative so it's kind of scoring approaches um, using modelled quantities and as we've talked about monetary or non-monetary evaluation in accounting processes um, and then opportunity mapping is looking again at both drivers trade-offs um, etc um, using these tools so there's various tools for supply supply versus demand analysis and lots of them use various approaches to that um, using this for habitat network mapping um, and then also kind of cost effectiveness analysis within those. We can go to the next slide. That'd be great. Um, so this is a, I think Doug might be familiar with this. Um, and he, he may have been involved. This is from the Oxcam um, ARC work on natural capital, which is a really, really valuable resource. And uh, I've put that in at the end. Um, this was from their summary. This is just looking at six tools um, that have emerged. Um, and if you could pop pop up the first pop up. <laughs> um, I won't talk through all of these, um, but this is just to try and give us a sort of flavor of, of what, what these are actually doing. Um, so the ecometric tool is basically using, it's looking, it's quantified 18 different ecosystem services. So it's quite an extensive tool, which is quite simple to use in replicate it's basically an excel uh, matrix spreadsheet system um, based on expert sort of inputs um, to try and yeah score ecosystem services across a number of different areas and it's linked to a habitat map so that's one approach um, and i'll talk about that a bit more in one of the case studies um, then ecoserve gis um, which people may have come across this is what i think nature scotter of, uh, thinking of using potentially in their tool this kind of approach um, which is a sort of step up from the ecometric tool um, so it overlays spatial data um, and then uses some sort of simple models to then link those to ecosystem services and ecosystem service provision and we'll, i'll talk about that a bit more in a bit and then some of the, the sort of more complex tools of this, for example, the Nevo tool, which is produced, I think, by Def, uh, by um, uh, Exeter University, um, which is using much more kind of economic modelling and kind of dynamic modelling to look at various relationships as well. Um, I won't talk about that so much. That's a, quite a complex tool with a lot of stuff in the background, um, but worth looking at their website again to see the kinds of things they do. So coming on to the case studies, um, I'll talk about three just briefly. Um, so this is one that's in this climate exchange uh, report, um, and it was the People and Nature Network um, that the South Downs National Park uh, developed, where they used a natural capital approach to identify hotspots with environmental challenges needing bespoke solutions and investment. Um, they used um, basically a kind of iterative approach um, to develop a kind of I suppose an opportunity mapping approach based on habitat maps um, for the park and also through quite extensive stakeholder consultation in a number of areas to determine which were the kind of priority hotspot areas and priorities of natural capital assets 
And if you could go on to the next slide. Um, this is a case study which they use this EcoServe GIS um, approach um, to understanding and ecosystem service delivery. Um, and this figure on the right is a, a schematic summary of how this works. So it's all based around a, a compiled habitat map um, and then the use of um, some simple spatial models to calculate scores for a set of, I think it's nine now, ecosystem services. Um, and then the, the, it's possible to look at some spatial dimensions and demand and supply of those in relation to, say, local populations and things. Um, so it's it's quite a useful, relatively simple tool, which is now being developed um, on another uh, open access um, system, EcoServe R, um, which, as I mentioned, I think is one of the options that Nature Scott are, are looking at as a basis for their approach. It doesn't give a sort of absolute value of um, natural capital in terms of either monetary values or in terms of which services are sort of better than others, but it does give you a kind of relative value compared to a baseline. Um, so useful to useful to look at that in more detail. We can talk about it more um, if you want to move on. Uh, the next one um, is this isn't in the in the report, but I thought was useful to include because it's um, a very large scale application of the natural capital approach, so regional across county approach in England. Um, and there's some very nice resources um, online which um, summarize how this uh, case study was implemented. Um, again, quite a similar process, um, although it started with, as far as I understand, started with mapping and looking at opportunities um, and threats in, in across the area and also used Natural England's, they have some natural capital indicator maps, which are unfortunately not available in Scotland, but they were used as a basis for stakeholder discussions. But the bulk of the work was on this natural assets step, um, step three at the bottom, creating a natural capital baseline, again, through compilation of various data sets to create a very detailed habitat map, and then using a scoring system to look at various ecosystem services at quite a strategic level and then that was linked to benefits and values and i'll talk a little bit more about the scoring approach there so if you could move on um, so as i mentioned so the baseline map first um, is the ordnance survey master map so kind of widely available layers um, a set of rules and layers that's from the report they call it rules and layers if you look into the background there's quite a lot in what they mean by rules and layers um, but basically they they were trying to develop a classified habitat map which could then be used to link to various ecosystem services it used an ecoserve gas as a link between tools um, you can start to see some of these tools are more commonly used than others um, and also it was run with best available data and most accessible data, which was quite an interesting approach to sort of find out what you can do with what's out there without investing too much in new data. And then the linking of environmental benefits. Um, this is an example of part of this kind of complex matrix, but probably one of the most extensive matrices that links these habitats down the left to a whole set of ecosystem services and this has been compiled through a review of hundreds of papers on these areas and it's basically a scoring system to look at um, the delivery of ecosystem services which has pros and cons it's nice and simple to use and it can be used at quite a strategic level so that was that if you could move on great um, the third case study is referenced in the CXC report in the annexes. Um, don't go into detail that much, but I thought it would be useful because um, it's quite hard to find sort of regional um, strategic scale natural capital studies in Scotland, um, which is great. I suppose the RLFs are going to produce that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the Nature Scott piloted uh, natural capital accounts, um, where again they used. Um, these four main steps setting the boundary and scope. So this was focused on uh, mainly nature's got land, 
using a baseline from 2017, where the most available data across a lot of data sets was available, and also using um, similar methodologies to those I've talked about before, but um, one that includes some biodiversity indicators as well. Um, this was compiled into a natural capital asset register um, using standardized approaches. Um, so the UNIS um, land cover classification system, and they also use condition scores from um, special SSSI data, etc. Um, which I suppose it's easier for Nature Scott than, than other areas because they have a lot of data at their fingertips. Um, so it'd be interesting to know how that could be managed within an ARLUP context. Um, and then from that developed an ecosystem service account um, using again a standard international system, the SICE system to link those ecosystem services to the assets. And then they did some costing and valuation and on the right, we can talk about it come back to it if you want, but that was the monetary valuation done for Nature Scott lands on the basis of that approach. So those are the three case studies. And just to summarize on tool selection, there's been a lot sort of written on this, um, but some of the, the recommendations working out what the purpose is, of course, um, is it to value a single ecosystem service for a parcel of land or to inform a more strategic approach? Um, what's the quality? A lot of these tools sort of fall by the wayside. Some of them are picked up more, um, and some have been more more quality assured than others. Um, obviously, there's accessibility questions. Some of these require quite extensive GIS knowledge, modelling knowledge. Some are very very easy without that knowledge. Um, limitations that obviously the data inputs um, and assumptions in the tools may may or may not be relevant to some areas. Um, transparency um, obviously is a key, key aspect and how the tool, for example, is can and, and is used with stakeholders and who those stakeholders are is important. Um, and then two quite important ones, the evidence of use. Um, as I say, they're, they're beginning, some tools seem to be used more than others. Um, and yeah, a lot of there are a number that are being developed sort of privately as well. Um, so it's good to not get locked into a tool that's less open access, I suppose. And then a key again is alignment with linked to that is alignment with it with what others are doing um, in this space. So that's mainly what I wanted to say about tools. Um, don't know if you want to stop there, Mark, or whiz through and we can talk. <laughs> Let you leave. Sorry, mute. Uh, yeah, let's do that and we can uh, look at the valuation and, and kind of link through to markets and stuff in the next segment. Uh, good news is for those of you who have to leave at three, you've got all of the most important content uh, for today. And we've got 20 minutes for discussion and questions. So uh, over to you, thoughts, reactions, questions. Maybe I can kick us off then by asking where people are at with their rural land use frameworks um, and uh, to what extent you are planning to use any of the methods uh, that, uh, that Leah has spoken about or other methods. Uh, or, uh, in fact, are you already using them or have you already got reports um, that uh, are sitting on your desks that, uh, that you'll be integrating into your frameworks? Where, where are you at and uh, with, with the framework process and, and how does this feed in? Um, Mark, I can come in on that for, for a starter. Um, or maybe I'll let Andy come in first because he's got his hand up. Yeah. Well, up to you. <laughs> no, fire away, dog. I was just going to give a quick update of where we're at, but Great. carry on. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're very much uh, working through a, 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 a stakeholder engagement um, phase at the moment. So we're just coming to the end of our first um, key round of stakeholder engagement or, or, or 
first round of our phase two work uh, to be to be more specific um so really trying to get a a good sense from stakeholders across south of scotland about what they think are the key land use challenges and key land use opportunities um and, and trying to kind of get a sense of that on a slightly smaller spatial scale than what what happened previously um so looking at some of the kind of landscape character areas um and the idea i mean this is actually really timely because the idea is then we want to develop a bit more of a explicit natural capital approach and um, i had a really good chat to leo probably a few months back now um about this um so that in our in our second round of engagement we really want to get into the thornier questions of what might be different people's views on what should be the priorities for land use change and where are some of those tensions and trade-offs and how might we seek to manage and mitigate those um and find the 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 multi-benefit opportunities that everybody wants to find um where we can um so that that's kind of just where we are but i'm sure andy can say it more eloquently and feel free to add in andy okay no thanks so yeah yeah i mean just just to add to, to that the, the um i guess the challenge for us is in terms of the the availability of data because it, mm -hmm. um, it is really helpful presentation from leo very grateful for that and, it, and it, there's great pointers there you know from from leo's work and mark's work to help guide the development of a tool and and we've got an opportunity to do that under our borderlands program um next year but for what we have to do for the all up and our timetable for that then we're going to have to make best use of available data sets so it's it's the baseline element which we kind of struggle with i mean you know as doug has explained we, we we're in the stage where we've got to do a bit more thinking and planning ahead for our next round of engagements and identifying what kind of um mapped outputs that we might require you know some kind of like scenarios that we might present to to uh stakeholders but we sh we struggle in terms of what data sets might be available so that is obviously the the um slam maps for um for scotland which you know perhaps can be used as proxies for ecosystem services but there's not a lot of information other than as leo explained for places like um triple si's and perhaps some of the um the river basin management plan water classification type data there's not a lot on condition so um you know we yeah we may not have the baseline may be patchy shall we say and i think for our pilot it's it's at a very broad strategic level it's for the whole of the south of scotland um so yeah i mean it, it, it'd be it, it's helpful to us to sort of share from your experiences and i'm sure we can draw upon doug's experience with the oxcam arc work as well that there's work gone on before at that kind of scale but um and uh, using the best available evidence as well crucially in that particular case yeah so interesting um so i think that's you... probably a common challenge for for all of the pilots and you know i'll link to this because uh, work obviously keeps on the core but um Scottish Government's land mapping team of, of um, are kindly helping or offer off to help the pilots in terms of, you know, for the JS side of things, we might be able to help in terms of um, creating JS projects or the relevant data sets and generating some outputs for us. But I think we're all probably slightly scratching our heads about, well, what do we, what's going to be the common ask? And then what's the bespoke ask for each of the separate pilots? So we're working on that this month. Mm. So the view that that we'll get um we'll, we'll set out what we want in terms of our natural capital assessments if you like by the end of this month mm -hmm. um yeah so, so i don't i don't want to hold i don't want to hold uh take over from the south of scotland here i'm sure the other pilots want to input from mm. their perspective but yeah well uh, we can maybe come back to you and uh, depending on who's available later on after after the break um because i'd like to see if we could actually get to a very concrete outcome which is well if your objective is to be able to present scenarios to stakeholders and workshops versus if your if your 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 goal is to do opportunity mapping for the win-wins um 
uh, two different purposes, um, uh, but uh, depending on which of those purposes, if this is the data that you have access to, which of the tools that Leo has uh, spoken to um, would you look at first? Um, or is there kind of a short list that Leo might be able to suggest? Huh, if that's what you're trying to achieve, if that's how rubbish your data is or how great your data is, um, then why don't you have a look at this and this to start with um, and just get that kind of concrete outcome? I think that would be really useful if that's not putting Leo too much on the spot. But I think that's going to require a little bit more detailed discussion if we can push that till after the break, as long as there's someone from uh, south of Scotland still there. Is that okay? Seeing Leo nodding, fortunately. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Good. So, um, Karen, I think you're next. Over to you. I think you've more or less just answered what I was going to ask, and, and it was a question to you guys. So I'm, I'm not an expert in this at all, and I, I find it difficult to get my head around all the different systems that are out there. Um, and, you know, we've been talking about, you know, developing a tool, and I, I just wonder whether actually there are tools aplenty out there, and what we need is guidance on what would be best to fit our situation and then put any resources we have to plug that gap that Andy's talking about, about baseline data and actually uh, commissioning or using AI or whatever to, to increase the, um, the uh, up-to-dateness of our baseline data and the, the detail yeah. of our baseline data. So for me, that's the, that's from a layman's point agree. of view, the fundamental question yeah that I think maybe you guys could help us unravel. Exactly. Why use your resource to create a tool if there is one that would do the job? Instead, you can use that to gap fill to make best use of the existing tools. Perfect. Karen, are you available after three? Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's try and do that um, for for you as well, if that's okay. Um, and uh, I'm not going to promise too much. Who knows whether Leo will be able to come up with a, a short list of try this one first, but we can we can see where we get to. Uh, Lizzie, over to you. Thank you. I was just going to give a, a little outline of where oh, we have got please, to. Please, that would be great. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> but it's maybe slightly unfortunate timing in that there was funding available within a window, as is so often the case, that we had to jump in and just get started on uh, this baseline assessment back in sort of May, June, led into July and August. Um, we, so we uh, contracted some consultants, SLR consultants, who are very helpful and um, flexible with our uh, nebulous demands. Um, we, yes, there, I mean, echoing your um, concerns, Andy and Doug, about availability of data. And we, because of limited time and resources, uh, um, we focused on biodiversity and carbon storage as the two ecosystem services. But we also wanted to try and make it a bit more um, tangible for communities um, so that people could really kind of, you know, make it feel more accessible and so we tried to look at some of those cultural services and that's I'd like to talk a little more well here a little bit more about those actually because they're so hard to measure and in the end because we've got really quite a big area and really quite a lack of data we just focused we sort of took a place-based uh, participatory approach to the, particularly to those two uh, two cultural services which were food and food provision and education. And it was just very hard to get any meaningful data. And we had some really interesting conversations and that's kind of what we found from the whole approach. We try to be as sort of participatory and collaborative as possible. So, I mean, the positive of it, of it is that we, we got in touch with a lot of people and got lots of data from different sources. Um, and we, <laughs> we have a massive great report, which of course we understand all of very in depth. Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, I mean, us getting our heads around it is one thing, but we have, we back in the summer held one online participatory meeting to sort of present the preliminary results. Um, and that, that was interesting in that we realized quite how inaccessible this language is. And so that's obviously 
a task to try to break that down um, for ourselves, but also for our neighbours who aren't trying to grapple with this on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, we're there um, and, and trying to figure out the next steps of what we do with, with, the, with the information that we've got, how we make best use of that and you know, treat it as a tool rather than just a static report. Um, and we have, I'm sure the rest of you have heard from John Yurt, Nature Scott about their development of their tool. So hoping that as that happens, we will be involved with that. Um, and see, I don't know if it will be duplication of effort, but try and make the best use of that opportunity. Um, and also the, yeah, the ARPID opportunity as well of, of accessing more data, making better use of existing data. I'm, like Andy, I'm not quite sure where we're going with that either. Um, oh, thanks, Mark, you put a link to some Place attachment cultural services. Oh, that be really <laughs> might have been really useful five months ago. That looks. We'll have a look at that and see see well, where it, we go next. There are a lot of methods out there for um, evaluating cultural services, and I would also yeah. recommend the National Ecosystem Assessment and the National Ecosystem Assessment follow on. Um, I did some research on on that particular project as well. Um, uh, and, and I think when, when you look at these, um, uh, broadly speaking, they divide uh, into monetary um, approaches versus non-monetary approaches. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what we're trying to, to do with these is uh, ideally, rather than using an existing framework um, where we fix the options, we're trying to be more inductive and base this on qualitative data to start with to get a sense of what, what our... Uh, the things that people value most uh, in a landscape um, uh, beyond just the carbon biodiversity, water, flood risk alleviation, etc. So, um, so broadly, what are, what is that kind of range of different things that people appreciate and value? And then to get a sense of, well, how important are they uh, relative to each other, but also relative to those more traditional, uh, easily monetizable services. Yeah. And to do that, you can convert everything into a monetary value, for example, using willingness to pay surveys and other uh, ecological economics types methods. Uh, or you can do this in a non-monetary way, uh, for example, using a really simple tool like uh, multi-criteria evaluation. Uh, so uh, which of these are most important to you? Um, uh, and uh, what criteria uh, are you going to evaluate these against? Um, so it's important because um, it, uh, um, uh, it will protect our community um, uh, or uh, something less tangible. I'm, I'm trying to struggling to think of the criteria you'd use in this example on the top of my head, but um, uh, we, we did this um, looking at, um, at the value of, uh, of marine ecosystems for anglers um, uh, versus divers, uh, two very different use cases um, uh, and two groups who are in conflict with, with each other. Um, uh, but there's there's a lot of different case studies out there. Uh, so the key thing is that uh, there there is a, there are a range of different things. It's not just I mean, the regular one is recreation, um, but yeah, recreation, uh, education. I forget the third one that you came up with, uh, place attachment. I think was it. Um, so let's let's broaden out what cultural services might be based on what people actually tell us is important to them, yeah. and then then let's think about how you prioritize them and think about their relative importance, whether in monetary or non-monetary terms. And the final step then is can you then map that? Uh, and that's something that I haven't done, but that Chris Raymond has. Brilliant. Well, that's that sounds all really helpful. Um, and obviously we have had this baseline report done and, and we did have to just sort of select um, a, a subset of ecosystem services, of course. And we did try to do that in a, in a collaborative, discursive kind of a way, um, but there is scope for much more work on it. And we're going to be working with, as well as the Nature Scott um, uh, natural capital tool, we've also got another little sort of sub project going on looking at landscape values. So all that you were just saying there would be really useful in that. And we thought that one of the next steps with the natural capital report would be um, sharing it with a few sort of uh, hand-picked people to have their feedback on it. And um, 
we might not put you on the spot, but last week we heard from Keith and Claire that you were willing to be supportive <laughs> of, of the various adults in different ways. So we thought that maybe you'd like to have a look at our report and, and we could have more in-depth discussion about where we can take it next. Yeah, yeah. So I'd be delighted to, um, until I can confirm funding for this, it will be light touch. Um, but hopefully I can still add value light touch if I can confirm funding. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, yeah, it's a mere 80 pages, so I mean, like to have just fun. Um, just one other point on it was um, the, what could be taken as a kind of quite big headline from it was that the monetary value of the carbon stored in all our massive peatlands out the back here um, was 17 billion pounds. Um, and it, that's just a sort of an interesting figure of what earth does that mean to us as communities? Um, Obviously, it's not. It's the, that's the society societal value rather than the market value, but it's um it's the sort of thing that might attract attention and have it. Those will be interesting conversations to have of what that means and what we. Yeah, that's a very big mean. number, isn't it? Yeah, that's going to stimulate conversations. Um, but talking of stimulating conversations, that uh, we are going to have to actually pause this very stimulating conversation. <coughs> because it is coming up to three. A few of us need to leave. I'm going to suggest that we take a 10 minute break, if that's OK. Um, when we come back, uh, Leo, if you've got anything to add on cultural ecosystem services, I'd love to hear that. And then we'll move to you, Karen, and we'll uh, ask answer any other questions. Uh, but we'll then zoom in uh, on uh, specific cases as well. So thank you for those of can you. I, can, I, can I just say, because it's, it's related to Lizzie, just I would be really, in, I'm not an expert, but really interested to see your report, Lizzie, if you don't mind sharing Absolutely. it more widely. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And sorry to everyone if uh, I took up too much time in the discussion. No, I don't think you it around the pilots, Lizzie, if it went around all what the pilots. What was that, Andy? Sorry. If it went circulate it around all the pilots. So yeah, be... yes, we've, we've, just got, we've just got the final version and, and we're just finalising the story map, ArcGIS story map that goes with it, um, which I try to make a bit more accessible. So, yeah, uh, we'd love to do that. Thank you. Ah, nice. Thanks. Great. Thanks. So enjoy your break, guys. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off so you know when I'm back. And maybe if we all do that, then it's kind of a sense of, yeah, we did come back. We're not just now talking into the void. So enjoy it. I'll see you at 10 past. I'm sorry, Mark, just to say, I, I can't, I'm going to have to leave the meeting, come back in because I can't use my mouse for some reason things crashed <laughs> so, okay no worries i will see you soon <laughs> okay i'll see you if i can get out of this yeah i'll hold Thanks. on and wait and look oh no no it's okay
Okay. Welcome back. Leo, do you have control of your computer again? Yes, I do. It's working. Yay. <laughs> Very sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Start the whole thing. So welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, so let's just start. I was wanting to give Leo a chance if he wanted to add anything on the evaluation of cultural ecosystem services over and above what I said. Um, uh, to be honest, not not huge. It's not not my expert area. Um, but I, I suppose, just reflecting on what Lizzie said um, in terms of looking at existing tools and how they're doing it, it seems very similar approach um there's very little information on how that was then actually uh, i suppose accepted or not by communities more locally um and i suppose the other thing to say and reflecting on what you said mark in terms of how you map these is is again what where are we trying to get to with these tools and is it a strategic sort of sense of uh, for land use planning across a very large region or is it a a local kind of decision making framework or is it both and maybe in that sense we're talking about two approaches here a kind of a broad sweep um for which i think there are quite a lot of existing resources um plus some kind of deeper dives and how can those be sort of married together and it would be interesting actually to look a bit more from a kind of academic perspective but also practical to to see how how that those sort of different scales are in, incorporated within this the sort of natural capital approach. Um, so yeah, so we're pushing it back to people a bit on well, where are we trying to get to here? Uh, because in terms of the cultural sort of services question, for example, some of the, the ecometric tool, as I mentioned, that was based on a, a sort of look at all the literature um, across a number of indicators um, in terms of well-being indicators, etc., um, linked to different habitat types, um, they, the authors say that's one of the most comprehensive look, looks at the evidence. Um, so there are ways that it can be done. Um, I wouldn't be very sure how how people locally would take that if they were then talking about issues, sort of mapping issues in a local sense. <laughs> so, yeah. Andy, before you come in, I wonder if, if I can build on this, because uh, your, your comment has come from, I think, from, from Lizzie's comment that actually the reason why you wanted to include the cultural ecosystem services was because you wanted to ensure there were community benefits. And I think that that is, OK, maybe not. OK, Lizzie, to, to an extent. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. To an extent, I suppose to make it relevant to to people so that they could understand why we're doing it. I mean, that's what yeah. question I was often asked at the end, sort of, at the end of trying to explain what we've been doing. Is that why? What does it mean for me? Um, and and there's lots of answers to those questions. But if you can if you can relate it very directly to something that they experience in their every, everyday life, then that helps. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So, so with that in mind, though, I think that then there, there are two different reasons why and ways in which you might think about uh, cultural services. Um, and the first is is to get a sense of uh, of how important um, these considerations are compared to things like carbon. Well, carbon. Let's go with carbon because that's that's the key one. Um, and so if you take an example um, near where I live, there is an area of land that has some, um, some archaeological sites. Um, they're not listed, they're not protected in any way. Uh, and the new landowner wants to plant trees for carbon. The local community are saying, yeah, plant your trees anywhere you want, but not over this site. Uh, and uh, and yes, we like carbon. Yes, climate change is important, but not at any price. And actually, for us, this site has real cultural significance. And yeah, this trumps everything else uh, for this particular location. Um, so there's, there's an element of, yeah, so actually, what are the community's priorities? And can we just assume that we all agree climate change is a priority pretty much at any cost and it, it, it trumps everything else? Um, so, so there's that element to it. But then the other element is just to say, well, actually, what do you want from this process? 
Um, and if I give you another local example, I live down the road from Jeremy Leggett, um, who recently bought a, a, an estate and is rewilding it. Um, and his assumption was, uh, I'm going to make this a mass ownership company. I'm going to open this so that local people can buy a share in this company and can get money back from the estate. And uh, in the public meeting, it went down like a damp squib. Um, uh, and, um, and someone was like, well, yeah. Uh, actually, what we want is for you to repair the bridge over the river, because that's actually really important to us. If uh, if this project leads to you fixing the bridge, then great, job done, I'll be happy. Um, and, and something as simple as that. And so here we are, assuming everyone is up for climate change, up for transforming our farmland into woods and getting a share uh, in the financial benefits of the carbon credits, when actually, you know what, yeah, uh, fixing the bridge would, would be good enough. <laughs> Maybe don't um, don't, don't so, talk quite so publicly about the damp squib comment. <laughs> I don't want to upset my neighbour, uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> uh, Andy, over to you. Maybe it's just a, an aside, really, but linked linked to the sort of cultural um, value part of it. That um, under the earlier land use strategy pilot, it was it was certainly a gap in in the information that we put together and the, and, and the evidence we gathered and the tool that was developed you know we didn't really tackle that cultural services aspect of it adequately um, and we did our, did our best but it's less to do with the sort of sense of place that we looked at it from from that perspective and um, it was thinking about the archaeological side of things so mm. we did fund a, a small sub project which looked at trying to develop a, um, a classification a layer for historic land use value which they they tried it into the sub catchments and and um in the tweed but um couldn't get agreement with um historic environment scotland on the on the criteria basically so it sort of sat there but that gap still remains i, I know it, it, it's not necessarily to do with the sense of place um but it's it's, it's from an archaeological sense it's somewhere which captures you know the, the cultural heritage importance of, of landscapes which would be particularly important for a region like the south of scotland but um it didn't it didn't move forward so it's it's worth looking at that again but again it's that's more thinking beyond the all up to next stages of development and the development of a of a mapping tool in mm. terms of what we can do now again it's sort of scrabbling around to what to see what available data sets that are um we may be able to capture some sense of place mm. evidence when in our next round of events um, but the, um, you know, we, we're stuck with uh, uh, scheduled ancient monuments, and um, there is a historic environment record, but it's it's huge, you know, mm -hmm. it's just going to pepper the, the landscape with records. So it's something that would bring together clusters of that data, you know, um, which, which I guess the historic land use value is trying to do. It would be beneficial, but. So I'm just flagging up, there's still a gap. There was a gap, you know, five or six years ago, and it still applies, really. But to, to go back to the work that, that you're doing in South of Scotland and, and that you've already done, Lizzie, and, and let's just keep this incredibly simple. We can get really complex and add different layers and features. And, and the reality is, if you just do some good deliberative work with your local communities, they'll tell you if there's something really, really important to them. <laughs> Yeah, like, well, actually, give us a new bridge um, and we'll be happy, kind of comment. Uh, and it's about just doing that early and listening to that and taking that into account, I, I think. Uh, so, so let's not get too worried about uh, the, the gaps in data and how expensive it's going to be to, to fix them properly. Uh, Keith. Yeah, thanks, Mark. It was just to come in on, on the, the very point there um, that you were saying about the, the community aspect and, and getting people's opinion. So I think you're absolutely right about the, the kind of damp squid, not that we use that as an example, but um, so there is an assumption and it's a very wide held assumption that if you pay people money, they want to do it. Uh, you know, life doesn't work that way. It is not a black and white decision. Um, and, and this kind of emotive side of, of, of land across Scotland is something that, that I know certainly uh, the minister, Ms. McCallum, is, is, is really interested in and, and really is quite focused on that, that hearing from local communities around what they value, what they see as priorities. 
because ministers, I'm sure everybody will be aware, ministers get it in the air from, from lobby groups, from interest groups that, oh, it's fine, we're going to give them money, everything's grand. It's, you know, it's the good old re-smog fracking. Ah, they'll not complain if we pay them. Uh, aye, folk do tend to have some sort of morals and ethics about them. It's not all about money. Um, so really having the opportunity with the Arlops to capture um, some of this, um, and it's not just that, that kind of black and white, um, we have this spatial data, we have that spatial data. It is, it, it is really important to get that, that local opinion and that local consideration for what they feel is important. And simple things like a bridge is, you know, it's grand, everybody, everybody recognises the need for trees, but actually for them, what's more important right now is, is if you can fix that bridge, yeah, bash on your tree somewhere, <laughs> that's, that's grand. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that that the kind of cultural side of things is, is, is something that's being um, uh, considered as well. Um, and on the data front, I mean, we've pilots, we've spoke about this several times. We're, you know, we're very much aware of limitations of data and it, it is going to be based on the art of what's possible and what's practical. We all know what we, we would love to do if we had millions of pounds worth of funding and, uh, and the like. So it's just to reassure the pilots again that, you know, gaps are, are gaps are expected. That's, you know, that's not anything that'll be held against you. It's, it's really good to be able to showcase where the gaps are. And we can say to ministers, look, if you want to take this forward, we're going to need to invest in this, 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 and this. Um, so that's also a, an important learning. So I will go back to being quiet again, because this is not really a, my forum to, to, to go, uh, but I just wanted to come in on that. Well, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Don't go quiet again, because that was really useful. I think um, it just, being reminded of that priority. This is a, a, a priority of the minister. It's a priority of Scottish government uh, collectively, uh, of you therefore, and therefore it's something we do need to pay attention to. Um, and just because it is a bit difficult <laughs> to even get your head around, let alone go out and collect data on, um, isn't an excuse to say, well, we'll just kick that into the long grass. We need to do something. And I think that the message here is um, that uh, as long as you do good stakeholder engagement, um, uh, that's good enough for Keith, it's good enough for me. Uh, if you do that well, you do that responsibly, um, and then you're gonna hear, people will tell you if there are really big issues, uh, problems, things they're not happy about, if there are big things that they want, you know, won't necessarily be able to, to, to meet everyone's expectations, but uh, but we can capture that. Um, uh, and I think it's important to to give voice even to the things that, uh, that conflict with each other and would cancel each other out. Um, and to the process um, and to do that in a way that ultimately arrives at something that people are happy with. Um, and, uh, and I think for me, uh, uh, a step uh, on top of just we're talking about this uh, is to do that multi, multi criteria evaluation, because what you then get in terms of the output is great. We've had a discussion, but now we've actually all been able to, to vote about these different things uh, that we could prioritize. And we've been able to discuss the criteria against which we might uh, we might actually rank these and sort of why they might be important. And at the end of this, we've got some kind of a ranking. And it could be that there, there was one person who wanted a bridge um, and it was actually just the farmer on the other side of the bridge and nobody else. Uh, and now, uh, all, despite there's been a whole lot of discussion about this bridge, um, uh, you know what, when it, it push comes to shove, nobody really thinks it's that important. Uh, and you get that coming out of, uh, of your multi-criteria evaluation. And finally, I think what's really valuable about these, as I mentioned in uh, the session with Jane Glass, is that the evidence is quite clear. Uh, it, these kinds of decision support tools um, where we're ranking things and such like, uh, they're not about consensus. And I think that you're kidding yourself if you're expecting consensus. Um, I don't train in and use consensus-based approaches myself because they tend to force dysfunctional consensus. Uh, instead, um, what these tools do is they give everyone a fair say. And at the end of it, people typically report, uh, you know what, I still disagree with what's come out as the top ranked thing, which we're now all going to go away and prioritize. But I accept it. I live with it. I don't keep revisiting, uh, undermining, delegitimizing, fighting against it, because you know what, it was a fair discussion. I had my say, it was all done transparently. And that's why things don't always go your own way. Leo. Um, yeah, I suppose I just wanted to reflect, I don't know if this is playing devil's advocate with that, but if you, how do you do that? Um, I suppose the Arlops are being asked to create a strategic sort of regional spatial mm. plan eventually. And 
what's the system for incorporating a set of multi-criteria sort of deliberations in a number of specific communities and then integrating that into a spatial plan i think that's that's where i haven't quite got my head around how mm. that's done i'm sure there's a way to do it um is it then using that kind of ranking across the whole area um or or were we not actually are the arlops not not going to produce a spatial plan or is it accompanied by another more discussed i'm sure that, yeah there are all sorts of options but it's trying to sort of mm. get my head around how it, how it's linked together because I think then there's a question of what the objective is for the mm. of the ALF itself, mm. um, which is key obviously to the kinds of tools that are used. Yeah. So I'll, I'll bring Keith in in a sec, but I think for, for me the um, the key thing here is the word strategic, <laughs> and yeah. strategic means um, uh, that uh, that we are not keeping everyone happy. Uh, this uh, yeah. this, this is not uh, that we're dividing everything up and, and making something happen that, that, that everyone wants. Um, you, know, you have to make hard decisions when you are being strategic. Um, but for me, if you're going to take strategic decisions at a landscape or a regional uh, kind of scale, yeah. uh, the key thing is that you are looking at that landscape and regional scale. Um, and so there are, and there are lots of ways in which you could do this. The ways in which yeah. I've done this in the past have been um, using scenarios. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, here, uh, here is a scenario of what this landscape might look like if we were to prioritise carbon, uh, if we were to prioritise yeah. this, this or the next thing. Um, and what we're then able to, to do is that is to is to then think actually what is most important for for me at a landscape scale, um, and then based on that, what might be the, the kind of things that rise to the surface that you might want to try and integrate and get most of in that landscape. And once you've made those kind of strategic decisions, uh, then you can go down to that kind of site by site uh, basis. Uh, in an ideal world, you've got some kind of mapping modeling process uh, that isn't just randomly putting 50% trees on the landscape, you're actually looking at where they would be appropriate. Uh, and uh, on the peatlands where you might do the, the, the peatland restoration and such like, uh, but then you can go to that site by site kind of scale to start saying, yeah, we need to try and prioritize this. And yes, we accept there are trade offs, but uh, the strategic approach right. suggests uh, if we're going to do carbon and we're going to try and get as much as we can, this is where we prioritize it. Yeah. That kind of thing. But scenarios would be how I would do it and to try and keep this at, at, at that um, at that landscape scale. Yeah. Um, Keith. Yeah, just to, to kind of back the back that up, Art. So um, again, just as as a kind of expectation setter um, and, and the pilots will be aware of this, where I've said it before as well, there is uh, no expectation of them to spatially map. Um, yeah. Should the pilot choose and have the ability and capacity to do that, um, that's that's fine. Um, it is very much at that more strategic level is is where they're you know we're, we're expecting people to come in around opportunities priorities um, all that um, sort of thing for for the region so a very strategic kind of overlook at the region itself. Um, I I wouldn't imagine that you know I, I might be wrong here but I wouldn't imagine that there there's enough resource enough capacity and enough time to move on to to what would be a a kind of far more advanced spatial mapping kind of aspect of of the Arlof and the Arlops. So certainly to begin with grappling with that that wider sort of strategic priorities and opportunities and and uh, and um, community engagement is is where we would see it um, coming in at this point in time. But as I say, if if there is and, and pilots are aware of this, you know if 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 they have the capacity and, and the ambition to take it to a, another uh, level beyond that, then that's obviously something we'll we'll support. But there's no um, Leo just to kind of. Reassure you, there's there's no expectation that we'll be moving into that that um, spatial based um, mapping for uh, say trees, like you say, uh, Mark firing a whole whack of trees down in an area just to, to kind of demonstrate that they could be in that area um, whilst setting everybody um, off running because it's five different landowners you've just suggested are going to be doing something that they've not agreed that they're going to be doing. Um, so yeah. Uh, mm. Definitely something we'll have to grapple with moving forward, but as a first first iteration, I would not expect uh, our loss to be in that territory just yet. 
In the chat, I put a paper um, for a, a project where we did something along these lines. And uh, crucially, we did not do spatial modeling or, or mapping in that project, um, but we did do use, uh, we used some um, uh, models from the literature uh, to, to build some parts of the scenarios. A lot of it was just based on interviews and workshops with people uh, saying, this is what I think will happen if you do this, and that leads to this, and then that affects this. And huh, maybe that's what the future would be like. Um, a scenario just has to have an internal set of logic uh, that uh, mm -hmm. logic based on hopefully on evidence uh, or other forms of logic uh, this is what might happen uh, and now we can start thinking about that uh, Andy Thank, thanks Mark yeah I, I mean it's not an obligation to have a spatial component to it but we in our consideration so far we think it's likely to be needed in order to okay. express you know the, the, the um, prioritization and the, and there is that requirement for prioritization of land use change in terms of delivering against the climate change and biodiversity objectives so but obviously the pilots are there to test whether that's feasible or not mm. but it is built into our into the ask from scottish government that there's a need for that prioritization whether we can achieve it or not is obviously subject to our engagement with stakeholders you know we we hope our ambition is that it's possible Mm. But it will be at a, a sort of high level. But we feel we feel we got, are going to need some kind of spatial element to our framework to yeah, make it real and make it work. Mm. Yeah. So just point. Let's just going to highlight something Keith said though, just as a, as a minor warning. So I think yeah, this could be really valuable, and I definitely see the value of of doing this. Um, but uh, the, the problem I found when you start using spatial outputs with stakeholders is people start getting obsessed over the details and someone's like, hey, that's my land there. And no, not over my dead body. Will you ever do this? And, and then people get, yeah, yeah, well, that wouldn't work there because if you've not seen how boggy it is and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and you're trying to explain, no, it's just a scenario. And we're not going to tell you that you have to now plant up your land with trees. Um, but just to, just to warn you, you need to be very careful in terms of how you manage that and how it, get, it comes across and, and just managing the, the discussion. Yeah, I mean, I haven't worked on woodland strategies, or have you, you know, it's, I'm quite familiar with that. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a challenge, but you, you, you do need that indicative mapping to make it work. Mm. You just have to be prepared to explain what it means. It's, it, there, are, there are going to be people who will literally interpret it and, and those who feel it's identifying something on their land are probably more sensitive than anybody else to it, but <laughs> you just have to be prepared for that. Yeah, okay, you, that sounds like you are, are well prepared, uh, which is good. <laughs> but with the scale of uh, South of Scotland, I mean, it, it's going to be very broad and strategic anyway, so even more indicative than something which applied just only to the borders, you know, so mm -hmm. I don't feel that we're going to get obsessed with the the, the local landscape scale that's the next step mm. in the post pilot mm. phase or phase three of the pilot however it's described so yeah it's just like, right. yeah. i would like to move if we can um to karen and back to south of scotland in terms of uh, this more specific uh, prioritization of tools you might go and look at and um, so let's come back to what we were looking at uh, the, the tools the the modeling approaches etc um uh, and so really no pressure on you leo with this um see what you can do with this um and i think anything is better than nothing <laughs> but um karen maybe we could go with you first um and before you launch into this uh, let's just check with leo what information do we want karen to provide for us um and so uh, instantly the, the kind of the initial thing that uh, two initial things that, that i've got is uh, the purpose uh, uh, of this so what, what are you what do you want what do you want to get out of the tool and secondly, what kind of data do you have? Um, so that's what I'd like to hear from Karen, but I wonder, Leo, do you want to hear anything else to help guide tool selection? I mean, you've got a whole slide of things, including like the like, <laughs> expertise in the, in the team, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think uh, spatial scale um, is yeah. important. Um, expertise as well mm. is important. and possibly go reflecting on the conversation and not reflect in my presentation spatial tools versus other tools as well if yeah. potentially if if it's not if a spatial map is not required <laughs> there are a whole sweep of other things we could look at great so karen what do you want to do and at what scale and um what kind of data do you have and uh, let's see what we can make of this 
but I might have to defer to Andy for this because he's more of an expert <laughs> than me. Oh, um, you're both in the same same area. Yeah, sorry. we are. We are. Uh, we, yeah. to be honest, we haven't actually as a team because we've mm. been a bit more focused on the consultation on the here and now. We haven't discussed in great detail um, what form and how how this um, this framework will and the spatial element of the framework will work. Um, I just know Andy talks about a tool and and I did uh, we've also got this this added element of the borderlands project which is looking at um, data in the south of Scotland for natural capital re, you know broad scale natural capital uh, purposes um, and you know we've talked again about you know tools to manage data and present data in certain ways and and but I'm conscious, always conscious that so many people doing very similar things. It seems around the country, and you know, at government level, and uh, down in England, and and you think, you know, are we are we just adding another um, another sort of uh, IT tool into the 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 general soup of of what's going on? And you know, we've got limited resources, but they're quite precious you know it's an opportunity I feel uh, what we get from stakeholders constantly is that we don't have data we don't have up-to-date data we don't have data at sufficient detail why don't we have these figures for this and that and um, and so uh, what what I looked at a while back and from a, a, a point of complete ignorance I must say and got quite excited about was um, was not necessarily the manipulation of data tool, but the how you actually get the data more up to date. So the whole thing of satellite and AI manipulation of data and that sort of thing. And, and so I suppose what I'm questioning, and and it's probably one for Andy as well, because he's he's more focused on what the output will be. Uh, both for the pilot, but also this sort of slight, it's very much linked to the pilot, but this stage with Borderlands is, you know, what, what are we going to do? And given that you guys are the experts, this is, a, for me, an ideal opportunity to say, you know, if we have a bit of money in the south of Scotland, how do you, what do you think we should do with it to get best value from it in terms of increasing our knowledge of uh, natural capital in the region and enabling um, government bodies but also NGOs all sorts of other people work and private landowners say working in the field to access data more up-to-date data and make decisions based on that better decisions um, yeah maybe uh, and and I'm not much more don't know much more about it than that I mean, just from a personal point of view, um, the important, the things that I think are important are mapping land use change. And I know the government's doing that, uh, but at a quite a high level. And, you know, how important is it to go a step lower? Um, we've talked about that with a number of data sets that, that they're done at a national level, and that makes them less useful at a local level. And do we go you know, the res do we take the resolution down so that we actually get more, more detailed information for our area? Um, the opportunity, which I know Andy's done in the past for um, opportunity mapping and this, this showing where, where you can do certain interventions to get multiple benefits. And uh, I think that's the sort of thing that Andy did uh, in the previous pilot. And I think that has, you know, is very valid and would be very useful. I also quite like the scenario planning type approach as well. I think it would be really useful to be able to say, well, if we make these decisions, what are the potential outcomes? Because I think quite often we make decisions without that knowledge or, or we make assumptions, or, and especially maybe if we're talking about people who maybe don't have quite as much knowledge as maybe you guys do, you know, are making decisions. If we can give them 
something that helps them predict what the outcomes are from those decisions in terms of land use. To me, that could be really useful. But I must have stress I'm coming at it from a very non-technical background. So, you know, it might be I'm asking things that just aren't, aren't feasible. But I would like Andy's view on this because it's probably... Mm -hmm. yeah. He's probably maybe got very different opinions and, and you know, he's far more experienced in this than I am. Yeah, Andy. Yeah, thanks, uh, Karen Mark. Um, it's, um, I mean, um, Karen did a great job in pulling together the strategic, for the strategic proposition for the Borderlands pilot, the, um, the case for the data pilot, which is now embedded within the Borderlands programme. So I think a lot of what Karen was saying there will apply in terms of the development of a, a decision to port tool under the borderlands data pilot, as we describe it, um, rather than less so than what we're going to be doing with the all because of the time scales. You know, we haven't got time to develop a tool, probably even li fairly limited time to apply an existing tool if one's available free to use, shall we say. Um, it is more about sort of defining the purpose of the decision support tool uh, and then considering what kind of data we want to include in it. Because we're also going to be involved in um, Nature Scott's um, sort of piloting work for their landscape scale assessment, to, not a capital assessment tool. So, and, and obviously we've been in dialogue with Leo um, around his research fellowship, which will help guide us in terms of, you know, his, his, his appraisal of what's out there and what we might need to, to um, meet our ask in terms of a data tool that's suitable for the south of Scotland. So it, it sounds like it's going to need something which is, or we need to develop something which is below the landscape scale, because if Nature Scott are going to develop their tool, and presumably that can roll out for the whole of Scotland, then is there, is there a gap there in terms of that, it's, it's that more local um, guidance that's needed to inform more at a sort of field stroke farm scale? But it's at such an early stage because we've got we've got to scope out in more detail that data pilot. Um, but just sort of initial thoughts are that that's probably where we need to head. Because if we're going to have a tool that's developed, piloted by Nature Scott, which can be then rolled out across Scotland, there's no point in us trying to replicate that, or duplicate that, and therefore it's something which is more local scale, which can be used for people developing a project or a set of collaborative projects with a, a group of farms or whatever that kind of or an initiative by one of the um, environmental partnerships, that kind of scale. What I would quite like to know is, is, is there, because uh, I mentioned earlier, Keith has lined up sort of generous support from the Scottish Government land mapping team. But if there's a tool that we could use, which is free to use, and wouldn't take up too much time, then we could explore that. But I haven't had really time to think about it. But if there's some of these tools that have been mentioned in Leo's presentation, that, that if there's no cost to it other than collating the data and someone pressing the button, someone who has the GAS capacity, because unfortunately I don't at the minute. But uh, you know, if, if that's a feasible tool to use that we could use for generating some outputs on our next stage of engagement, um, that would be helpful and potentially something that could be used to generate the final output as well as our spatial element to our framework. But so there's quite a lot of overlap between what we want to do in the short term for the all up and then what we want to develop in you know over the course of the next one to two years in terms of a decision support tool which you know is, is the is the kind of thing which we developed under the earlier land use strategy pilots but we were able to develop that tool in concert with our engagement work you know so uh, we're not in that position with this it's, that's, that's going to have to follow on as an, as an activity after the pilots I suppose what, what we want to do is try and make sure that whatever we do in the short term fits neatly into the long term and we're not, you know, doing abortive work or whatever, you know, resources are, are tight. So we want to make sure it all fits together properly. And, you know, in my view, if, if we are very short on resources in the short term, if we possibly can find something that's already out there that will help us. Um, uh, and you know uh, to do the framework um yeah but anyway I, i'm i'm not an expert on this so. 
Great. Um, so that is really helpful, really full, Leo, and you've, you've got quite a lot of background on this anyway. I'm just going to make a note on the time. It'd be nice to, to move to that final segment um, in a, yeah, five to ten minutes. We can do it very briefly if need be, just to, to wrap things up. But uh, Leo, over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, ooh, there's a lot of factors to take into account. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, thinking about specific tools, um, uh, I suppose an underlying point, I mean, yeah, there are a lot out there and definitely I don't think there is a need to reinvent the wheel here. There's a huge amount of tools out there. Um, I think the couple, the three I've sort of mentioned, they're not, it's not clear whether they've been applied in Scotland in a very, um, yeah, yeah, whether they've been applied in a very accessible way at least, um, but I think they could quite easily be adapted with minimal expertise. A lot of them are based on a simple habitat map. Um, and then, but then there is a question about exactly why, why would you want to do that? Um, is it going to cause more problems than, than solve them if you're using it at a community scale or at a strategic level? So I'd need and you'd need to think through a bit more about exactly again why why you're using them um, so the the ecometric approach for example could be used and sort of paired with hab existing habitat maps um, i think the question of habitat quality and remote sensing that karen mentioned um, i think there are huge advances going on here um, i wonder whether that in time and this is probably something for nature scott could could the remote sensing data be used in terms of the sort of quality that Andy mentioned earlier in this session, um, could it be used as a sort of indicator for habitat quality? Um, but that would have to be uh, thought about more. Um, I suppose what I keep coming back to is the you talk about whether taking the resolution down to sort of community scale or whether this is strategic. Again, I kind of feel like um, me and Mark and everyone else <laughs> needs to sort of bash heads, heads together a bit more to sort of think about whether whether it's a different set of tools completely at a sort of sort of local consultation level, whether you do want to use spatial data. Again, I think some of these existing tools, again, they could all scale down and use local data and be integrated into GIS mapping if you wanted to use that as part of a sort of consultation process, but with the caveats that Mark mentioned that it may cause more problems than it, it solves. Um, depending how it's it's used. But I think in terms of having a sort of map of services um, in an area and exploring scenarios, that's that's not impossible to do. Um, they all take resources, um, even just compiling the data sets take somebody with the right expertise, I suppose, but none of it particularly complicated. Um, so that, that what I would discount completely is some of the more advanced sort of economic Sort of dynamic tools which i think are really interesting that defer and, and others are supporting the development of to look at sort of farm payments and how how the kind of if you change the sort of incentives that changes um farmer decision making in a landscape and and what impacts that has on the natural capital so those tools in the future um, i've talked a bit with the guys at exeter about whether that they could be developed in scotland but there's no there's no sense of how and when that might happen. Um, so I think there's a whole suite you could easily sort of discount. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I mean, happy to have a more of a conversation about some of the ones I've presented, which are the sort of the simpler end and well used as well um, and more strategic. And I suppose the final point is, um, again, this is a bit caveated by whether Scottish government wants you to produce a spatial map or not, but thinking a, a little bit more about how this might integrate with some of that stuff I put up about the context initially about natural capital accounts um, and the asset index and how, because those are all using the national data sets and whether eventually the ARLFs, if it's a whole, if all the ARLFs are using a different suite of tools um, and different private sector sort of economic evaluation schemes a lot of them are very similar when you come to look at it but they have differences in their details um how on earth does that then integrate into the sort of national strategy system in the very long term but that's 
probably not something you want to worry about now, but I, I suppose we should be thinking about now if this, these are pilots for a future policy. Um, Unless Keith wants to say something on that, sorry to Keith to put you on the spot. Um, uh, how concerned are you that uh, our uh, use um, comparable, similar, the same kinds of, of methods and approaches in the development of their RLOFs uh, for you to be able to then integrate and, and do stuff with? So one of the reasons of uh, one of the reasons for the pilot was to provide the flexibility for people to see what works oh, um, okay. at, at a regional uh, level for them. Um, when it comes to the kind of data sets and stuff, we do have we do have the national scale ones. Um, you know, I think it's it's been well well said here and well documented elsewhere. Um, when we go below national level, that's when we all start to struggle. Um, you know, data sets are are what they are. Um, so. Yeah, I think there's a there's an understanding that if if local knowledge and lo local data sets are available, then that's that's absolutely grand. It makes it more relevant to your region. Um, so I'm I'm not overly concerned at this point. Should should people be using more localized um, information to to kind of formulate their discussions or formulate uh, the our our luff um, as it comes to fruition? All that can go into that that wider kind of knowledge piece of, of what makes this work or what stops it from working, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, because what we've got here is 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 an opportunity to test these things out. We have no no set uh, structure, no set data that that people have to use. Um, and we have no, as it stands at the moment, and this causes part of the uncertainty, we have no set final usage for the our love. That will be uh, up to ministers once we have a, a discussion around them at the end of the, the pilot project. Um, so it does give us that flexibility um, to, to allow people a bit of creative freedom within the region um, without having to worry about it not being uniform. So I'm, I'm not overly concerned at, at this point. Okay, good. Uh, Karen, Andy, let's hear back from you then. Good. I was just going to ask Keith if, in you know, assuming assuming that the ministers want to see our looks rolled out um, after beyond the pilots, will you then be looking at sort of what was produced by the different pilots and sort of selecting a more standardised approach? Uh, so, she, she, what are we doing now? So the certainly the 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 option will be something that is presented to ministers. So if there is a, a sort of a minimum standard, if you will, for for what is is achievable across the board. So so if it's around um, identifying opportunities, a method to do that, a method around um, stakeholder engagement or setting priorities using the natural capital, you know, the specific tools that, that the pilots have found work and work well. Uh, then we can certainly look to incorporate that in in any uh, sort of advice we would give to the next lot of pilots. Unfortunately, you guys are the test case here, so you have to bear the brunt of it. Um, but certainly, all all the learnings that we get from this can be fed into into a, a next phase uh, of pilots. Um, ideally, I was you know ideally I would suggest if we do get to a point where we have complete national coverage and and, and we're looking at what the Arlofs can then be used for in terms of policy influence. Um, we would need to have some sort of standardization um, so that, uh, you know, at a minimum, there is a certain uh, amount of data coming forward. So the key data that would be needed to um, for them to be involved in, in the policy discussion evidence base. Um, but I think we would always have to have, and, and this is just me personally, I need to clarify that, this would all be there. We would always have to have an element of uh, regional freedom because otherwise it, it just doesn't allow you to then make it specific to the communities and, and, and the regional environment and economy that, that you're working with. So there's always going to have to be that freedom. Um, yes, at one point we may have to come into, right, you need to have X, Y, and Z as the baseline of, of your, your RLUF because those are the types of information we would know to make applicable to the policy areas that you, you, know, you want to influence. Um, but on top of that, you know, almost the world's your oyster, so to speak. But um, yeah, that's that's my opinion at this point, not not that's a beautiful. not a government <laughs> opinion. Of. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that sounds very very logical, doesn't it? So, Andy, I think a, a final word from you, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap things up. 
Yeah, we, we just need to be conscious of the incredibly tight time scales as well, because the, um, you know, as we mentioned before, Doug, that we would just, well, in fact, this evening is our last stakeholder event in this round of events, you know, so we've held, this will be the 20th event that we've held over the last six, or seven weeks. And as an iterative process, the natural capital approach, then we're going to use that to guide what we might need in terms of a tool or mapped outputs. So we have to have time to consider those outputs. We've got this month to be able to do that, to shape our ask, if you like, for, for the next round of events. So this, this information, the kind of um, you know, natural capital outputs that we need to inform the next round of stakeholder engagements, which then can lead on to informing the development of the decision support tool on the borderlands. But we have to be conscious that we've got, all the pilots have got very limited time to take this process through. And therefore we are, we, there's no time to do anything co overly complicated. Things have to be available off the shelf in terms of data sets and tools that are free to use. And, and, and that's as far as it can go realistically. Um, so, you know, with, with more time, you know, we, we, we could have perhaps developed something more sophisticated, but it's just not, um, it's just not going to be possible on the time scales that we've got. Doesn't mean it's not meaningful, but mm -hmm. that's just the parameters in which we're operating under. Yeah. yeah. So Lizzie, like me, you've been pressed with 20 stakeholder mm -hmm. events, uh, a massive effort. Um, and just wondering if you can share any outputs um, of that with the network. Um, uh, and also explaining that, uh, that she's planning to have a suite of local scale baseline maps for consultation at community council level. Um, and uh, well warned of what could go wrong. So let's see. Uh, and I think the more that we can share across the network, so the better. So, um, Absolutely. That's great. yeah, we, we, we'll, there'll be an interim report, which we, you know, we need to share with stakeholders before Christmas, basically. So that's our intent. Um, and then there'll be a final report at the end of March on once we've concluded our stakeholder engagements, which will set us up for developing a framework. So yes, absolutely, we can share yeah. that, that, those outputs, yeah, thank you. So we're coming up to four, uh, if it's okay, I'm gonna conclude. I've got a, a couple of slides, um, which I'll do very briefly. And Leo, I'll let you decide if you want to um, present the, the last few slides um, uh, with kind of links to other material. I don't um, need to, no. No, okay, great. Okay. Um, you'll, uh, you've got the, the presentation. There are lots of references, links, other things that you can follow up in the rest of the presentation. Um, uh, helpfully, we've covered this already. Um, so uh, there are lots of different approaches, uh, three broad categories um, uh, that you can take if you want to value the ecosystem services. Uh, that, uh, that you might have quantified and mapped in various ways. Um, but uh, the key thing from my perspective is just to emphasize that uh, that is not um, a necessary precursor to uh, engaging with ecosystem markets. Um, and I think that uh, in, in my opinion, I think one of the most useful ways in which these can be used um, is to build business cases uh, often for public funding and that's certainly what we found in the uh, in the case studies uh, that's that was the main use of these uh, of these valuations um so ultimately uh, if you don't need a, a valuation um uh, to, uh, to to create a market for these and, and to sell them then what do you need and i'm going to suggest that in very simple terms just three things so uh, you need to actually have something to sell. Um, so this is uh, typically an ecosystem service, or it could be a reduction in risk. Um, so a reduction in uh, flood risk to a, a piece of, of, of critical infrastructure, for example, um, reduced risks of, of drought uh, or other kind of climate change things on supply chains, things like that. Um, uh, and uh, and there's something kind of quantifiable, verifiable about these. These are new things that are only happening because of these payments, um, and they're not just going to disappear overnight or get easily reversed. Uh, so a, a real benefit uh, that you can sell. Uh, but secondly, it's a benefit that is in demand uh, from buyers who are actually willing to pay for that benefit. Um, but that as well is not sufficient. Uh, there needs to be trust for there to be an actual market where uh, buyers and sellers are willing to exchange uh, and the, the, the buyer knows they're going to receive the, the payment. Uh, it's not going to suddenly get clawed back um, or, or disappear or not be real. And the person uh, who is buying that service knows that what they are buying is going to be a real verifiable thing. 
Um, and um, broadly speaking, I'm, I'm going to stress there are two approaches to, to this. Um, I will put into the, the chat um, a little bit more in depth on this. Uh, the first uh, of these approaches um, are governance mechanisms. I'm going to call them that broadly, and that is things like uh, carbon codes. Uh, but other kinds of codes and standards. Uh, it's potentially uh, layers above that in terms of uh, standards that guarantee those codes are good. Uh, principles that are at those markets is things like um, regulators, uh, financial conduct authority, things like uh, UK accreditation service, uh, checking that the verif verification bodies are verifying appropriately to those codes. So yeah, governance mechanisms uh, is one kind of thing. So let's use an established code, for example, uh, or it's about trusted intermediaries. Uh, and the example I'll give here is uh, the Landscape Enterprise Network's coordinator role. Uh, the, these uh, local bodies who are known and trusted, who can then uh, aggregate supply uh, and demand uh, and make those deals happen. Uh, and it is their trust that we work with. I've realized realize we're out of time. Um, so the rest of this is from the report. Um, and the key point is when we engage with these, we engage with care, things can go wrong. Um, so... Uh, it just remains for me to say thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Uh, this has been a, a really useful series for me, getting to understand uh, your context. Uh, to be honest, I wish we'd been able to do this before we'd actually done the report. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, uh, I've learned lots. I hope you feel you've learned lots. Uh, as I said, I'm very happy to provide light touch feedback on uh, any of the work that you're doing. Um, so if you send that through Claire in the first instance, um, I'm getting, trying to get funding to uh, provide more in-depth support. Um, I'll let Leo decide what he's able to do in terms of supporting as well. Uh, but uh, my hope is that we continue engaging with each other. I'd love to continue helping you uh, and, uh, and just let me know what you think I can do to add value. So good luck, everyone, and stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very thank useful. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank, yeah, you. thank you. Nice thank to see you. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. <laughs> thank you. A big thanks to Mark and, and yourself, Leo, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks very much. Appreciate it.